He served with churches under the Convention of Philippine Baptist Churches, and the longest of which is in Happiest Christian Church for 20 years. And that's the church of my uh, mother-in-law. And uh, the speaker for today is the pastor of my mother-in-law. He also served in the copies of Sapulana Baptist Churches in various capacities, like Board of Trustees, Advisor on Youth Affairs, also served as Chair, President, Advisor of Fellowship in Baptist Churches, Circuit Level in the copies area. He was ordained into the ministry in July 2013. He is married to Percy, who is a nurse in New Zealand. <coughs> And also, they were blessed with a daughter by the name of Tricia Victoria. She's 15 years old now. And, of course, she is with a mom in New Zealand. And here in the U.S., for the Advanced Clinical Pastoral Education at Baylor University Medical Center. Our speaker for today, please welcome Brother Ted Garesa.
then there's no need to explain these two scenes. They are in themselves, are in themselves stories that's pregnant with meaning. And of course, they deserve not only in an applaud, especially the second one, but also a very serious consideration when we compare the situation and the reality of our existence, especially nowadays. To complement those videos, I also was so inspired by the story of a young boy, aged nine years old. His story was shown yesterday in a channel, I think it's part of the news, it was uh, broadcasted in the CBS. His name is Keelan Bain, and this boy's project was to collect scrap metals. First of all, he started collecting tin cans, like the sodas and um, milk cans and so forth. And heard his mom ask him one day, what's the purpose for collecting the cans? And uh, Kalen responded by saying that this, could have, this may cost something if I sell this to the scrap buyers. And the mom further inquired, what's the purpose for collecting these tin cans and converting this into cash? And Kalen answered his mom, um, I have a friend that we've been, I've been starting communicating with and he lives in Uganda. In, in Uganda. And he doesn't go to school because he's so poor, his family is so poor, they cannot afford to go to school. And I'm selling these tin cans to collect some money so that I can send school supplies and hopefully provide also money for tuition for this my friend with whom I am co communicating or coordinating or corresponding with. And sensing the advocacy of this young boy, the mom joined in the bandwagon. And in their community, they've been posting this uh, paper, encouraging their neighbors to collect tin cans. And upon collecting that, they will pass by each one house after the other to collect these cans and to sell it to this crop metal buyer. To Kayla Bain, or Kayla Bain, this is a very simple step of making a difference, not only in his school, but also in another person's life across the globe. And the message of Kayla and Bain somehow reached the entire school district. And the principal and other school teachers somehow encouraged the students that they may not need to follow Kayla and Bain's advocacy, but they can make a difference in some other ways, making an impact and hopefully changing the lives of other people for the better. The mantra that Kayla and Bain and these people embraced is the fact that there are difference makers everywhere. They're the ones who saw the reality of pain and the problems in their society, in their community, and in the world that hurts people and decided, they made a decision to stop complaining and pointing fingers and instead make a difference for good. These people, including children, you don't need to be that old to make a difference. Keelan Bean is only nine years old, but he decided, he realized that he can make a difference. These people don't need to be doctors of physics or rocket scientists. They are and can be and will be simple people who love people and wanted to know that they care. Of Psalm, Jude, verse 22, the Bible says, Have compassion, making a difference. Not long ago, off the coast of the Dominican Republic, a couple was attempting to break the free diving record. The first clip showed us a man, a driver, who's eating glass. Some eat blame or metals. And Maybe who knows, before their life ends, they may have eaten the whole car because of that feat. Really, people do something, anything, or just about the natural to let the whole world know to set a record, and that's their way of making a difference. It's like claiming a personal pride. It's their personal goal or aspiration. To eat the whole car and to eat the whole 
China set on the table. And here's another one. This couple from the Dominican Republic was attempting to break the free diving record, a sport of testing how deep a person can go on one gulp of air. After Audrey had descended to the predetermined depth of 561 feet, her lift bag tragically did not inflate. What should have been a three minute trip without oxygen turned into eight minutes of eternity while her husband Francisco watched helplessly from the surface. Audrey never lived again in this life. What a tragedy. Living on the edge to break sporting records and in the end dying in vain. Someone said, only one life that will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. The first clip showed us a personal pursuit for personal pride. The other clip showed us a man. I don't know him. I don't know where he came from, his profession, or his desire or aspirations in life. All I can see in that clip is a man handing sandwiches and water bottles to the homeless, touching them, extending care and compassion, one life at a time. As followers of Christ, our mission is to make a difference. Not so much in these four walls of the church, but to make a difference where we needed to make a difference. The Bible says we are the salt and light of the earth. And salt is needed where there is a tasteless, bland situation in the kitchen. And light is needed where there is darkness. And Jesus categorically said, the world is a dark world. And as followers of Jesus, our task is to make a difference. And in order to do so, I would like to offer at least several things that we can do. First of all, determine to remain close. This church is very close to each other, close to the members of DMIC. I appreciate so much how each one goes out of his way or her way to provide transportation, to provide a visit, to provide care, to gather resources for the new immigrant coming into this country, into this place especially, and to provide them accommodation and to make them feel at home. Hence, developing and cultivating closeness among you and among each other. And that's the beauty of the relationship that is found in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it does not happen just by an accident. We have to determine, we have to decide to remain close to each other. And that's precisely what the church in Acts chapter 2 decided to do. In Jude chapter 20, or chapter, verses 20 and 21, the words of Jude says something like this. If Engel can show it, then well and good. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And another passage is found in 2 Corinthians, or rather in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. There are different kinds of gifts, the Apostle Paul wrote, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. First of all, Jude emphasizes the words, or I would like you to turn your attention to the words, you, yourselves, and yourselves. Notice each time the plural pronouns are used. You, yourselves, 
and so forth and so on. And in the Epistle of Paul of the First Corinthians, he said, different gifts, but the same. Different gifts given to different people in the church, but coming from the same Lord. There is the basis of our unity. There is the basis of our coming together. Our understanding. And God is the cause for the unity of the church in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been brought together by the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul wrote. We have been brought together by God Himself. And together we must remain. We are not the body of Christ separated. I am not the church by myself. Only as I unite and gather with other believers, I become the church. The Hebrew writer encouraged the believers in Hebrews chapter 10, 25 to 26 to continue on coming together in worship of the Lord. Because some have already decided not to join in the fellowship. Nowadays there's so much whole about about individualized spirituality, expressions of relationships to the divine or to whatever it is that is, that is sacred to anyone and to everyone. Our neighbor back in La Carlota City, they're an old couple well, they're both dead now. My mom, since day one, I've been encouraging them to come to our church. And since some of the times these old couples or elderly couples could not cook for themselves and their children could not be there with them, my mom would share with them food, cook some extra. Providing them an image of a caring person. And hopefully by that example, my mom will be able to get some moral higher ground to be able to have a leverage to one day ask them to come to church because this is somehow the effect of the life of Christ in the life of a person. But not a day, not a Sunday that this couple joined us in the church until they died. The wife one day said to my mom, I didn't go to church to worship God. I can stay in my house. I can pray in my home. And I can still worship the Lord. I have heard the same words up until today from the mouths of many people. I need not come to church to worship God. I need not come to church to be a Christian. God is everywhere, therefore I can Worship Him wherever I may be. That may be true. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ provides people a kind of warmth and fellowship and acceptance and comfort that no house can ever provide. Hence the encouragement of the Hebrew writer to don't Forget the day of your coming together. Because some have already made a decision to leave the church and express spirituality by themselves. Determine to remain close. Decide to remain close to each other. That could serve as a very strong weapon and resource that any Christian can have. Especially in the midst of the struggles of life. How many of you here have been blessed by the fellowship of the MIC in the midst of your crisis in life? Had it not been for the church, you would have fallen away from the faith. Had it not been for the presence of fellow believers in Christ, you'd have turned away from God. As parents, as a family, as a church, as friends, 
as a team, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called away from the world's pattern of individualism and self-centered pride into a community of unity. Secondly, if we are to make a difference in the world, we have to deliver compassion. Give away compassion. There's a song in the VCS and in the Sunday school that says, Love is uh, like a magic penny. Hold it tight and you won't get any. Spend it, lend it, give it away. It will turn right back to you. Give compassion. Deliver compassion. Evangelism is not simply saying the word, but living the word. When you think of love, who do you think of? Christ, another Christian. In Jude 22, or Jude 22 says that differences are made by compassion. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said, When you've given this things and share these simple things to the least of my brethren. You've given it to me. And what were those? A visit? A glass of water? Clothing? Many of us, if not all of us, have those things with us. I've been invited to a feeding program of Baylor in the in one of the churches that partners with them. And we were able to provide food, hot meal, to more or less 300 people in one day. Another chaplain in Baylor also encouraged me to go to one of the ministries that he's advocating, feeding the homeless, people living in the streets, living in the garden, gutter people, homeless people. And on that day, we were able to serve more or less 800 people. And he told me one day, this is the other side of Dallas. Other than these beautiful houses, tall buildings and so forth, these people live in the dark. And no one seems to notice that they're here. Every time I pass by that box over there, by the Second Baptist of Dallas, I say a little prayer. Those are tissues, toothpaste, soaps, toothbrush, vitamins. I wonder where they go. But I'm sure that those items will be beneficial. Whomever gets a hand on those things. Deliver compassion. Real love. I recently saw a short video about a street preacher who packed his box of tracks and went out into the city to preach. He shouted loudly about hell and judgment and sin and proudly condemned people to hell, especially those who rejected his message. He took the truth to the streets. The truth to the streets. The truth can be harsh. The truth can be difficult to swallow. But when coupled with compassion and care, people will listen. But this preacher only brought with him the truth. And the end is that he condemned people. He forgot the love and mercy of our Savior Jesus Christ. All of us are familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. In the speech of Dr. Martin Luther King entitled, I've been to the mountain top during the civil rights movement, Luther made some comments about how and why the priest and the Levi turned the other way. But towards the end of his speech, Dr. Martin Luther King said, 
and shared his questions. And I quote, And the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, If I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? If I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? My brothers and sisters in Christ, will we care enough to take time or to spend a dime on someone in need? We are good at talking most of the time, but can we listen? As two men walked along the beach at low tide, one picked up starfish, tossing them back into the deep water. And the old man told the young man, you'll never save them all. As the younger bent over to pick up another starfish, he replied to the old man, yes, but to this one, it makes all the difference. We can change the world. All of a sudden, maybe even at the end of our lives, there will still problems that will remain. But we can make a difference now. One life at a time. Thirdly and finally, I encourage all of us, if we are to make a difference, to dare to make contact with people. To dare to make contact with people. Jude 23 implies, or verse 23 implies that we might even have to pull some out of the, out of the fire, who are at the edge of hell, ready to fall into the pit. But how can we reach a world we never touch? Jesus touched people, but only by his words and stories, but literally, he touched people. Mother Teresa worked with what in the Indian caste system called the untouchables. She touched them one life at a time. As chaplains, as nurses, I'm only speaking in my context. I know teachers, you touch your students as well. As each one, they enter your room, your classroom, you touch their head, you touch their shoulders, and in your own way, you say a prayer to each one of them. There is something in the touch that makes others feel comforted, loved, assured, boosting their confidence. But there's also another touch that will end you up in jail. And that's the issue with the death thing. But down in the Philippines. Jesus touched people and he healed them. I believe in separation, in sanctification. We have been declared holy by the Lord, separated from the world. We are in the world, but not of it. But Jesus Christ still calls the church to be the soul and light of the earth. We are no longer a part of this world. 
but we are still here. Because God wanted to impact this world and change this world through the church. The church does not live in a bubble. Many Christians have employed the comforts of isolation instead of the power of real sanctification. Those of a different church, a different color, a different kind of different background, they made this their excuse not to touch people. What will I do to reach those outside of my comfort zone, Pastor? I don't agree with them. Their principle in life or philosophy in life is just east and west compared to me. What about those who intimidate me with their lifestyle? If I continue to fear, I will not be able to make a difference. Fear will hold the church down. But the Apostle Paul inviting to Timothy, feeling that this young man had been intimidated by the way the church is living its life in Ephesus, told the young pastor, God did not give you a spirit of timidity or of fear, but of power and of love and self-discipline. Jude 24 reminds me that God is able. He told or he hold me up or to hold me up in everything. And in Philippians 4.13, he also will be there to give me strength so I can do all things. There are a lot of examples in the church or in the, in the scriptures where the Lord has allowed certain characters in the Bible to, to go to these places and Hopefully to make a difference or impact in their immediate community or in their environment. And such was the case of Lot. Lot lived in a city where he could really make a difference, but he failed to do so even amongst his own family. My brothers and sisters in the Lord, as Christians and as a church, we are to make a difference Before I conclude this message, I would like to share with you a poem by Teresa of Avila. She lived between 1515 to 1582, and her poem says, or is entitled, Christ Has No Body. And she wrote, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which He walks to do good. You are the hands with which He blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you're all, you are His body. Christ has no body, now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. You are the eyes with which He looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. My brothers and sisters in Christ, in conclusion, God is not in need of the rich or the well educated. God does not need fine tuned techniques or well oiled church program or powerful communicators with thundering voices to make a difference. God just des desires a surrendered and available person and with you, He will make a difference. And if God through this message today has made a difference in you, don't keep it to yourself, don't hide it, pass it on, that He might make a difference in another life as well.